Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We're so excited to be here today and to spend more time in Genesis. Today we're going to be talking about Jacob and the Israelites. Um, our um, memory text is, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Scott, before we get in further, would you pray for us, please? Sure. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of studying your word together. Thank you for your Sabbath. Thank you for the good example that Jacob set for us of how to wrestle with God in a way that is effective and help us to learn a lesson from today and to um, follow the good example of the things he did. Help us to be more like Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So the family saga of Jacob continues. God, both the good and the bad, yet through it all, the hand of God and his faithfulness to the covenant promises are revealed. I always love these, these stories of these <coughs> fathers because, <coughs> excuse me, when I struggle, then I feel like I'm following after some interesting footsteps. Jacob is now free from Laban. Under God's blessing, Jacob has become rich. It seems that he is at last happy. He has reached his goal and is heading to Canaan. Yet Jacob profoundly worried about his future in Canaan and the threat of his, that of his brother. It is precisely at this moment that God chooses to approach Jacob. The extraordinary confrontation will radically change the character of Jacob. As a, re as a result, Jacob is renamed Israel. Jacob's counter with God in Peniel, Peniel corresponds with the Bethel encounter. The two accounts echo each other in words, structure, and theme. While well, Bethel begins at sunset, Peniel ends at sunrise with the prospect of a glorious future. And remember, what happened at Bethel was that uh, Jacob had the dream of the ladder and the angels going up and down to heaven. And the night that we're going to see him wrestling with the angel happens in Peniel. So is it a chiasm then? <laughs> After a night of wrestling, Jacob emerges from his encounter with a blessing and a new name. He has had a personal encounter with God of love and lived. In turn, Jacob is able to look upon the face of his enemy, his brother Esau, with love and humility. Then Jacob turns to his family and confronts iniquity, the rape of Dinah, the murder of and the murders committed by his sons, and finally the idolatry that's still prevailing in his own household. The distress of Jacob, Jacob's trouble before arriving in the promised land, is the first of the themes that we see here. It contains lessons of dependence on God and prefigures the eschatological distress of end-time people of God. Wrestling with God is the second one. Jacob's confrontation with God forces him to confront himself and to change. His confrontation contains lessons about significance of conversion. So this will be important for us because sometimes we have to confront things in our lives and make them change. So we'll see how he handled that. And then to face his brother is the third theme. As a result of this encounter with God, Jacob can see the face of God in the face of his brother. Fortunately for Jacob, amid the fear of what was coming, the Lord of his fathers appeared again to him in an incident that was a precursor to what would later be known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And we see the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 35 through 7. We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not peace. And, and ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hand on his loins like a woman in labor? And all their faces turn pale. Alas, for the great day, so that 
none is like it. And at that time of Jacob's trouble, but shall be saved out of it. And so that is something that, again, we have to look forward to um, as the final events take place. And we'll talk more about that at, at the end of our lesson today. And that night, Jacob the supplanter became Israel, a new name for a new beginning, a new beginning that would utterly lead to the creation of a nation itself named after him. In other words, despite what happens, the story of the patriarchs and their families is told in Scripture in order to show us that God is faithful to fulfill his promise and that he will so despite what at times seems to be nothing but his people doing all that they can to stop that fulfillment. And we've seen that fulfillment stopped over and over here in Genesis. From the Tower of Babel to Cain and Abel, it seems in most of the stories that we've read of our forefathers, they struggle to stop Christ's fulfillment. Jacob had, had chosen the inheritance of faith. He had in, endeavored to obtain it by craft, treachery, falsehood, but God had permitted his sin to work out its correction. Praise God. Yet through all the bitter experience of his later years, Jacob had never swerved from his promise to renounce his choice. He had learned that resorting to human skill and craft to secure blessing, he had been warring against God. From that night of wrestling beside Jabbok, Jacob had become forth. He had come forth a different man. Self-confidence had been uprooted. Henceforth, the early cunning was no longer seen. In place of craft and deception in his life was Mark's simplicity and truth. He had learned the simple lessons of reliance upon the arm of the Almighty. And amid trial and aff affliction, he bowed in humble submission to the will of God. The baser elements of character were consumed in the furnace fire. The true gold was refined until the faith of Abraham and Isaac appeared undimmed in Jacob. So we see that quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. So we look forward today to this lesson where we see um, Jacob and all of the trials he went through. So... With that, we have Sunday. Sunday's lesson. Wrestling with God. So, gone from Laban, Jacob soon has another experience with God. Knowing that his brother Esau is coming forth with 400 men, Jacob prays fervently to the Lord, even though he acknowledges that I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies of all the truth uh, which you have shown uh, of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Jacob truly has a better understanding of what grace was about. And how does the Lord respond? So let's read the verses together from Genesis 32, 22 to 31. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. As he took them, he sent them over the brook, uh, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed them there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen the face of God, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. So now I wanted to um, 
see what so what's this so the the lesson asks what's the significance of of this amazing story uh so then in hosea 12 2 to 6 it says the lord brings a charge against judah and will punish jacob according to his ways according to his deeds he will recompense him and he took his brother by the heel in the womb and his strength his struggled with god yes he struggled with the angel and prevailed he wept and sought favor from him he found him in bethel and spoke to us that is the god of hosts the lord is his memorable name so you by the help of your god return observe mercy and justice and wait on god continually so the question I ask myself is, what is it that caused Jacob's trouble? Uh, so the answer comes from Patriarchs and Prophet and says, the error that led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring that about, which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. And then another question I was asking myself is, was this error unique to Jacob? And the answer is definitely not. So, in fact, all along from the very beginning, it seems like that's what uh, one of Satan's temptation was to take a shortcut. For example, Satan uh, tempted Eve to take a shortcut to being like God, um, which in fact ended up leading further away from God and making, him, making her less like God. Um, so Cain also wanted to serve God, but he wanted to do it in his own terms and his own merits. And then later Abraham tried to secure his safety by telling half-truth to Pharaoh that his wife was his sister, and also using human means of accomplishing uh, God's method by taking Hagar as a wife. And then later we go to Moses, who tried delivering God's people by killing the Egyptian, which ended up costing him 40 years of exile in the land of Midian till the Pharaoh had died. Um, and then later after that, the people of God themselves, the, the Israel distrusted God's promise. And when God told them to go conquer Canaan, uh, they refused to go. But later when God told them, okay, you, you're not going to go, you're all going to die in the desert, then they decided to go in their own power, which of course was a disaster. Um, so on the other hand, Lucifer offered the kingdoms of this world to Jesus. If He offered him a shortcut, basically. He's like, why go through the cross and all this humiliation? Just bow down to me. I mean, compared to dying on a cross, bowing down to Satan would have seemed easier in the moment, but Christ knew better, so he refused the... Uh, offer that Satan made him to take a shortcut to uh, to being the uh, redeemer of the world. And this also has application to God's people in the end times. So in fact, one thing that I was thinking that was in common is that after Jacob prevailed with the angel, he was given a new name. But in the book of Revelation, it's also mentioned that everyone who overcomes during the time of Jacob's trouble at the end, we'll also get a new name. Um, and so let, let's read a little bit about that application to the end times from, uh, this is from Great Controversy. The people of God will then be plunged into scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling and of fear and not of peace all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And continuing on, Jacob's night of anguish, when he wrestled in prayer for deliverance from the hand of Esau, represents the experience of God's people in the time of trouble. Now, w one thought there is that... Um, in the same way that this was an uneven battle between Jacob who had his wives and little kids with him and a lot of flocks but he didn't really have an army he, he was being confronted by Esau who was uh, already more warlike than Jacob to begin with 
um, also having 400 trained soldiers or warmen with him. Uh, and we don't know whether those were members of his household as, as they were in Abraham's time or whether these were hired men, but either way it was an asymmetric battle. However, because of Jacob's reliance on God, he was able to prevail. And so similarly, the people at the end of time, the odds would humanly appear to be stacked against them, but with God on your side, you're always uh, assured of victory. So let's continue on from here. Um, because of the deception practice to secure his father's blessing intended for Esau, Jacob had fled for his life, alarmed by his brother's deadly threats. And then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Jacob's company, unarmed and defenseless, seemed about to fall helpless victims of violence and slaughter. And to the burden of anxiety and fear was adding the crush, crushing weight of self-reproach for it was his own sin that brought this danger. So should the followers of Christ, as they approach the time of trouble, make every exertion to place themselves in a proper light before the people to disarm prejudice and to avert the dangers which threatens the liberty of conscience. So I think the, the lesson to be learned here is that um, even if we have made mistakes in the past, that God is still willing to be compassionate and merciful and offer us grace. But we need to be um, persevering like Jacob was and to not let the Lord go. But of course, we have to approach the Lord in humility. Because as I said, uh, had, had Jacob's been a boastful or presumptuous demand on God, uh, he could have been instantly destroyed. But because he was asking in humility, God couldn't refuse him. So uh, with that, we'll move on to... to Bob. Monday. The brothers meet. Yeah, the brothers meet. And that's Monday. And um, this word, I, I really had to look it up. Peniel. And it means uh, when face of the face of God. And if you consider Jacob and the problems he'd had, the great time of troubles he had, this is called a power of a place of divine shift. Now, I, I wouldn't want to call it a divine shift. I would really call it a divine shift. He's going from wrestling with God all night and then dealing with his brother and all his children and all the things that he, he was doing at the, at the same time. But you notice... He completely trusted in God for everything. And uh, although I didn't really agree with him of taking the family and putting them ahead of him, the oh, little groups of them going ahead and, and kind of like protecting themselves, they're way in the back, but maybe that's what he wasn't doing there, but that seemed like it was. So if we look at uh, the two connections between Jake, Jacob's experience of seeing the face of God, of Peniel, and Jacob experience of seeing the face of his brother. How do you t tie those two together? I probably read the Bible several times and listened to it several times and I really didn't tie those two things together. But the way you would tie those two things together is the two greatest commandments between God and man and between man and man. First it was with between God and man, then after it was with between God, between man and man, excuse me. So those are the two things that happened. And it, in the lessons, it really shows quite a bit here on Monday. He bowed himself seven times before his brother. And he called him seven times my Lord. Genesis 33, 8, 13, 15. And down him by himself as his servant. Genesis 33, 5. Bowels echo his father's seven blessings. So actually, the seven times he bowed, as usually in the Bible is perfection, right? Seven times. Well, actually, his father blessed, thought he was blessing Yusu, but he was actually blessing Jacob with seven blessings. And if you read the, the blessings that 
uh, Jacob was giving back to his brother, those were the seven blessings in reverse order, which is pretty amazing. So it says, uh, furthermore, a blessing bows down to you. Jacob's intention was to pay his debt to his brother and return the blessing that he had stolen from him. And really, he did steal them from him, didn't he? And so he, that's what he did. He actually gave those seven blessings back to him. And then said of uh, Esau coming with, you know, you don't bring 400 men to come and greet somebody, do you? Not usually. Uh, our men. And so he got there, and instead of attacking Jacob, they both kissed and, and cried over this long time. And how, what, how many years was it? 20? At least 20. Yeah, at least 20. So they uh, uh, came back together again. And what's really surprising is over here in Genesis 33.10, it says that Esau had uh, said, uh, said that uh, he actually called. Esau had forgiven him and in uh, 3310, I have seen your face as though I have seen the face of God. He, uh, he's, Jacob was telling him that. So it's actually quite something. And was divine. It wasn't just forgiveness. It was actually divine forgiveness. If you look that up in Le Leviticus 2227, Jacob's experience of God's forgiveness of Peniel where he saw the face of God, it actually brought out in the lesson, he probably really didn't see the face of God, but he, in the Bible, when you see the face of somebody, you can, you, that can be their, their being, their body. Now re, repeated in the experience of his brother's forgiveness, which he identifies as if he saw the face of God. Jacob lives a second pineal, the first one prepared for the second one. Jacob has been forgiven by God and by his own brother. And you notice God's forgiveness comes first. Then after that, the forgiveness of his brother. It's interesting that Peniel means uh, face of God, but it also sounds like penitent. A shift, yeah, a Pen penitent, penitent, something penitent. major. I, I would say it was pretty major. I mean, this guy went through quite a bit in a short period of time. Now, when he wrestled with God the entire night, you know, you know, it wouldn't have been much of anything for God to, to end that really quick. But we have to remember he put his hip out of joint. Well, that's what I'm bringing up right now. Oh, okay. We put his hip out of joint for what? <clears throat> A reminder. And even the Israelites after that would not eat the uh, sinew around the hip because of what happened to Jacob. And so that, to me, he did that to somebody else, too. He left somebody else with a little reminder. Paul, remember? He never mm -hmm. really got his eyesight back. Hmm. Could he have given it back? A thorn in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he called it, didn't he? A thorn well, in the, the flesh. But the only one who's going to keep his thorn in the flesh is Jesus, the marks on his hands. Yeah, his in side. heaven. Do you imagine he'll, be, he'll stay a human being for eternity? Hmm. That's something to really you know, contemplate. So I'm looking here and I want to read you guys something from uh, supplements from Ellen White. And uh, I don't know if anybody can get that, but if you get the one app that I have, you can go down and it includes the supplements from Ellen White. Esau was marching against Jacob with an army. Basically, you could call it an army for the purpose of killing his brother. So, if you want to think he did, was that his purpose? According to Ellen White, it was. Mm -hmm. While Jacob was wrestling with the angel that night, another angel was sent to move upon the hearts of Esau. God actually sent an angel to move on Esau's heart. And you could see the difference what happened after the angel came into his heart. In his sleeping hours, in his dream, he saw Jacob in exile from his father's house for 20 years because he was afraid of his life, and he marked his sorrow to find his mother dead. 
they put that little thing together and you realize I always thought well here she never saw him again yeah. that was uh, that was the last time she saw him yeah. he saw in his dream Jacob humility and the angel of God around him how many times did God send angels to protect him remember Laban was going to come after him, and I, I'm sure he was going to do harm to him. Mm -hmm. Take his, all his cattle back and his daughters and everything else. Hey, you better not touch him. He dreamed that when they met, he had no mind of harming him. When Esau awoke, he relates his dream to his 400 men and told them that they must not injure Jacob. For the God of his father was with him. And when they should meet Jacob, not one of them should do him harm. That is really God's work. And uh, it, it was really, I'm going to skip down to the bottom. This is something for us. How often we feel that we have been dealt with unjustly. That things have been said concerning us that were untrue. And that we have been set any false light before others. When we are thus tried, we shall need to keep strict guard over our spirit and our words. We shall need to have love of Christ that we may not cherish an unforgiving spirit. Let us not think that unless those who have injured us confess their wrongs, we are justified in withholding from them our forgiveness. How often do we do that? We should not accumulate our grievances, holding them in our hearts until one of we think guilty has humbled him's heart by repentance and confession. In other words, you better confess to say your story to me first before I come around to read it in there. You got to get that app off. Really good. Okay, we're going to move on to. Uh, the violation of Dinah. And this is really, this, this lesson is really about Jacob's um, struggles in coming into and settle, setting, settling into a new land. So now that um, he's gotten the, the reconciliation with his brother in Canaan, we see him coming there in peace, or Shalem. He comes safely. And he comes into Shechem, uh, which is the land of Canaan, when he came to Padem and Aram, and he pitched a tent in the city. So here's the first time that his journey characterizes peace. He's, we, we see that in the scripture. So after he purchased the land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hanar and Shechem's father for 100 pieces of money. And then we see him do something interesting. He, re he erects an altar, um, showing his faith and his realization of how dependent upon the Lord he really is. For every one of the sacrifices offered, there is an act of worship. Yet, for the first time in his life, Jacob is exposed to troubles of settling into a land like Isaac had with Abimelech. And so if we read, if we just kind of, I'm just kind of, kind of summarize what happened in um, Genesis 26. We're going to look at pieces of, of Genesis 26 to what happened uh, with, with Jacob. First of all, we see that there was a famine in the land. Remember when Abraham settled, there was a famine in the land. And Abraham, as you remember, went into Egypt. <clears throat> However, the Lord said to Jacob, don't go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. So Isaac listens, and he dwells, he dwells in, in Gerar. And the men of the place <laughs> um, asked about his wife. And so he does the same thing Abraham does. He said, oh, she's my sister. For he was afraid to say she was his wife because he thought if he did, 
that they would kill her, him because of Rebecca, because she was so beautiful to beho behold. And so... Rachel? I mean, Rachel, sorry. Are we talking about Jacob, right? Yeah. Isaac. Okay. We're, yeah, actually, Isaac. We're talking about Isaac. Oh, okay. Isaac did that. So... Um, <clears throat> So we see that and, and show an in, in, endearment. And so now we see that after this, Isaac was able to settle down um, in that country, uh, even though this had happened because of, um, he wouldn't be put to death. So Isaac so sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well. So now we see the issues of wells, and they kept fighting over wells. So they would they'd dig a well, there would be a battle, and Isaac would move on. They would dig another well, and there would be a battle, and Isaac would move on. We see that Isaac's not being aggressive in this at all, but he's backing away. Now, for the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land, he said. So he ends up at Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants. So he built the altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And then Abimelech came to him from um, Gerir. And so we see Abimelech here as we had dealt with Isaac, and now he's coming to, to Jacob one of his friends, and Pinchel, the commander of his army, and said to Isaac, you have, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent, and sent me away from you? But they said, We certainly have seen the Lord in you. So we said, Let now there be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. So Abimelech comes. There had been hatred between them, but now peace is made. And so we see <clears throat> this feast go on um, that they have, and things settle for a little bit. And then comes Diana into the picture. And we see that, the, that Diana <clears throat> was the daughter of Leah, um, whom uh, had been born to Jacob. She went out to see the, she went out, um, I think, to the local mall. And when she was out there, <clears throat> the son of Hamor, the Hevite, prince of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her and violated her. But he loved her. He was really attached to her. And so um, he spoke kindly to the young woman. And so Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get this young woman for me as a wife. And when Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, now his sons were with the livestock in the fields, so Jacob held his peace until they came home. So Jacob didn't get excited very, really quickly. He, he held his peace for a little bit. Then Hamor, the son of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, and the sons of Jacob were grieved and very angry because he had done the disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which had, was not to be done. But Hamer spoke with him, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter, so please give her to me. So as we move forward here, <clears throat> they say that they'll give them Dinah if they'll be circumcised. And we see that, that they're willing to do that. And, but on the condition... Um, that, that they would do that, they would give her, they would give Dinah to be the wife. So they all became circumcised. And the words um, that they spoke became their agreement. However, on the third day, when it came, when they were in pain, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took a sword and boldly came upon them and killed them all. And, <clears throat> and not only did they, they kill him, but them, but they took everything and plundered the city. So the interesting part of this 
is that we see someone who doesn't know God or isn't one of God's followers do the wrong thing but is willing to make it right in love. And we see God's people being upset because uh, of what happened and felt violated and doing the wrong thing. And so that is something I think that we as, as Christians need to be a little bit careful about, that we don't get to a point of fairness where we hurt someone in the process because we think that we have been violated or hurt. So on that note, we'll move on to um, Scott. Prevailing idolatry. Prevailing idolatry. So Wednesday's lesson is called <coughs> Prevailing Idolatry. Um, so immediately after this incident, it says, um, God urges Jacob to leave Shechem and return to Bethel in order to renew his covenant. Indeed, the Lord tells him that once he gets there, he needs to build an altar. So um, once again, we sort of see Jacob brought into a time of trouble. Uh, this time the trouble was created by his kids. So uh, now once again he needs to repent and build an altar before God. And not only that, God actually tells them and, he, and they put away all the idols uh, that were amongst their camp. So probably when they took over the city of Shechem, they uh, also plundered some strange gods. Actually, it says that in this text. So let's read Genesis 34, 30, and then 35, 1 to 15. And uh, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and shall slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. So that means you too, apparently, to his sons. Uh, so he's like, you've done a bad thing. Um, and, and now it's the quote from Genesis 35, 1 says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of uh, Esau thy brother. Now, an interesting thought, and I'd be curious to hear from uh, from the two of you up here. Um, an interesting thought is that it appears to me that sometimes God uses some sort of uh, detestable act, as I, I think it was sort of detestable what Simeon and Levi did, that they killed this whole city because their sister was violated. That doesn't seem correct, probably in most people's sight, not in my sight either, um, not in God's or Jacob's sight either. But Nonetheless, God used it to sort of preserve the separateness of his people because um, otherwise this might have been the beginning sort of of an intermarriage. So sometimes God allows sin to punish sin. Uh, so it's, it's interesting how, how that occurs. Um, and, and it seems like that's occurred several times in the Bible. For example, one of the examples I'm thinking of is of uh, during the time of King David, um, his general... Joab murders Abner because Joab's basically jealous of Abner having too much influence in the kingdom of David when he had been his enemy, um, which David definitely didn't condone. Nonetheless, Abner's character was such that he was an ambitious man who might have led the kingdom in a wrong direction had he continued to live. So sometimes God allows these sort of... Um, bad or heinous acts to sort of work out the punishment of the things they were um, that were going on. Anyway, we'll continue on with the verse. I was just thinking though, God can even take situations that are where, where people have done things they shouldn't and turn them for good in the long run. Right. And we'll see how that um, pans out. So, um, then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Uh, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make 
there an altar unto God who answered me in this day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak tree that was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is uh, Bethel, and he and the people uh, that were with him. Um, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him, and he fled from the when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath uh, Bethel under an oak. And there the name of it was called uh, Alon Batuk. Um, and God appeared unto Jacob again, and when he came out of uh, Padanaram and blessed him, and God said to him, Thy name is Jacob, and thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give, uh, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from, uh, up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set a pillar in the place that he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereupon, and then he poil, poured oil thereupon. And Je Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. So, two ideas that emerge out of this passage are, number one, God needs to peep, keep his people separate from the idolatrous people around them. And secondly, God needs his people to put away their idols before he can call them his people and give them protection, which they very much needed. Um, and then I was thinking of some other incidents where uh, people needed God's protection, and yet God needed them to be fully consecrated to him. So the examples I was thinking of is that when Moses was going to meet Pharaoh in Egypt, he definitely needed God's protection. But because his sons weren't circumcised, an angel came and was going to destroy Moses. So his wife, Zipporah, who I'm guessing had been against this idea of circumcising her kids, had to do it herself. And then another incident was when the people of Israel were under Joshua and they were trying to c conquer the city of Ai. They couldn't do so because of Achan's sin. So his sin had to be confessed and Achan was destroyed before they could go on to victories and God could bless them. And now here's some commentary that was given. And this was from the same one that Bob was mentioning that's at the bottom. So I kind of copied over some of it, which I thought was very good. Um, so Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away all the strange gods that are among you, and clean and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me this day of my distress and was with me uh, in the way I went. So Jacob was humbled and required his family to humble themselves and to lay off their ornaments, for which he was to make an atonement for their sins, by offering a sacrifice unto God, that he might be entreated for them and not leave them to be destroyed by other nations. God accepted the efforts of Jacob to remove the wrong from his family and uh, appeared unto him and blessed him and renewed the promise to him because his fear was before him. And that was from spiritual gifts. Um, and then uh, continuing on, I'll give one more quote here, which I think is really good, and we'll, we'll end with this. The cause of God is to hold first place in our plans and affections. The love of the world is binding them like a thick garment, 
And unless they change their course, they will not know how precious it is to, se to practice self-denial for Christ's sake. All our idols, our love of the world, must be expelled from the heart. There are ministers and faithful friends who see the danger that surrounds these self-bound souls, who faithfully present to them the error of their course, but instead of taking admonition in the spirit in which they are given and profiting thereby, those reprove rise up against the ones who deal with them faithfully. So, in short, basically, um, in order for God to give us his full protection, we need to um, put away our idols and our love of self. So with that, we'll move on to Thank you. Thursday. Bob, you get to tell us about the death of Rachel. Yeah, his poor guy had one trouble after another, didn't he? And what was his great love? That was Rachel. How many so, years did he work for her? At least oh. 20, it seemed like. <laughs> Yeah, they kept changing the rules over there, but it was seven years for the first wife, and then seven more, so it had been... Fourteen years. Fourteen years, and uh, then after that, so if we go over here to Genesis uh, 35, 29, and the interesting quote here at the top of the page here says, What other woes did Jacob face within his dysfunctional family? How many of those do we have around? Quite a few, huh? I might even admit to that myself, but then again, <laughs> I don't want to say anything. So Genesis 35, 15 through 29 is uh, Jacob called the name of the place. God spoke with him, Bethel, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephesus. Rachel's travail, and she had hard labor, and came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her the exact same words God mentioned, Fear not, thou shalt have this son. Also, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, and she called his name Ben-Oni. I always thought to myself, you know, here she's dying, why don't they let him have the name that his wife gave to him, you know? No, he, he changed it. But then when you find out what the real names of these things are, it's, it's a different story. And Rachel died and is buried in the way of Ephrathah, which is in Bethlehem. Here we are, Bethlehem. And who was crying after their children in Bethlehem? Wasn't it Rachel? Mm -hmm. Yeah because of the children that were killed many years later uh, by Herod, Jacob set a pillar upon his, her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day of an Israel journey and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass... Are you going to mention their names, what they mean? Benoni. Yeah, it was, but go ahead and do it. So ben Benoni means son of my sorrow. Yeah. And yeah. Um, Benjamin right means hand. Son, son of my right hand. Right hand. So he, he changed his name to a more positive one. Yeah. Maybe he felt like he didn't like the name Jacob, so God changed it to Israel. So he changed Benoni's name to Well, Benjamin. that happened several times in the Bible. The names right. are changed. And then like you mentioned before, we're going to get a new Sarah, name. We're called Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, Abram. And then what about us? Dana? Yep. We're going to get a new name. Yep. I hope I get a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you will. Yeah. So, I might, and came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land. And here we go again. Reuben went and lay with Bel, Bilha, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now, if you go back to his daughter being raped, it says in the lesson that he really didn't say much of anything. Now, this happened to uh, his concubine, and the same thing. He really didn't say anything uh, again about that either. It says, amazingly, Jacob does not respond to this horrible violation, even though he is told about it. Genesis thirty-five twenty-two. Which to me is kind of strange, right? I mean, twice that's happened. Now, the son of Jacob was, uh, were 12, and they mentioned all the different sons here. And uh, 
that Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Erba, which is in Hebron, where Ab Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And it mentions uh, how long Isaac and uh, Isaac and Jacob lived. So this this is seems like one thing after another. And would you classify that as a dysfunctional family? Definitely. Definitely. And what happened? It seems like he got a fourfold. Did yeah. he kind of get a fourfold uh, deception? So he practiced deception on his brother and his father. So then, it seems like four times this deception was practiced on him. Yeah, Laban got sons. him pretty good, didn't he? So Laban, uh, with his um, changing his wife, <laughs> yeah, uh, to a, and then it happened with uh, Simeon and Levi. That was number two. Now with Reuben, and I'm trying to think if there was a fourth one. Well, anyway, because David was punished fourfold for his sin. So look at poor Joseph. What happened to him? Right. And God turns things around. And puts us for the good if you are willing to yeah, follow him. Yeah, so that would him. be the fourth one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that that is what happened. So this is close to Bethlehem. The birth then is the first fulfillment of God's promise for the future Israel. Rachel, with the very word God used to reassure Abraham, do not fear. Jacob changes the name of the dying Rachel. Okay, this is a, all right, you guys already mentioned that. During this time, Reuben has sexual relations with Bilhiel, the father of Compion, Rachel's maidservant. And not too before that, they ended up killing everybody in that town. Now, how come the people around there didn't go after him and slaughter the whole Jacob's family? Why? Probably because Jacob repented and prayed. No. God sent angels. Right, right. Because, Again, yeah. because he repented and prayed, God yeah. could do that. Just like he went to Laban and said, hey, Jacob's leaving, don't touch him. So, I mean, you, you can see this all the way through. And does God have patience with, the, yes. with that? Uh, Certainly. Do, do, do we have any dysfunctional families that he has patience with? I hope so. And, and well, we're old and, enough, Bob, to know that God has patience. Yeah, that's true. All the things we went through. <laughs> <I know. laughs> and uh, we know that he has patience with us. And uh, I like this sermon that the pastor gave a couple of weeks ago. It, it's not our faith. It, he actually proved that it was the faith of Jesus. Yeah. What good is, how is our faith? It's like a, a going up and down, up and down, up and down. We like a nice, steady faith. It goes all the way through to the end. And uh, so, amazingly, Jacob does not respond to this and then had 12 sons who will be the ancestors of Israel when his name was changed, despite all of the problems, all of the dysfunction, even outright evil, I would say outright evil several times, such as Reuben's sin, Bilia, Bilha, God will, will, was going to be fulfilled through this family, no matter how messed up this family really was. Now, at the bottom it says, how would it be, despite human error, God's ultimate purpose will be fulfilled? Imagine... What would happen if people cooperated? What if we got around and decided we're finally going to cooperate with God? Do what he tells us to do. If they obeyed him, how much more easily that is with less human suffering and stress and delay could God will then be accomplished? How much easier would it be if we would allow God's will to be accomplished? Is the key to the whole thing. If we allow the Holy Spirit into our lives and allow the Holy Spirit to do his good will and pleasure in us on a daily basis, he would be able to take control of our lives and things we wouldn't suffer quite so much. That would be a nice thing. Beautiful yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Scott, do you have any final thoughts? So I think the, my final thought would be that we need to learn from Jacob's persistence in wrestling with God 
and we need to wrestle with God, but in the way that uh, Jacob did, in a humble way. So in a humble way, we need to cling to God and uh, claim his grace and his righteousness for us. And not let go until he blesses us. That's true. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So there is a time in coming in the future, and Scott talked about this in, uh, on, uh, uh, about the um, wrestling with, with God. And there is a time coming in the future when we will have to wrestle with God if, if we're still on this earth. And often people have asked me, well, when is the time of Jacob's trouble? Sometimes there's confusion about <laughs> Yeah, but it, it, it's nice to know about it so when you're in it, you know that God had predicted it. And there's, I'm going to uh, look at two quotes from Ellen White. One is Christian experience and teachings, and the other is from the Great Controversy. <clears throat> and Christian experience and teaching says, I saw four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. And then will come the seven last plagues. So we have to remember when Christ's work is done in the sanctuary, that means his time of mediation has ended, right? So um, when, this, when his work in the sanctuary is done, and then will come the seven last plagues. These plagues enrage the wicked against the righteous. So these plagues um, that are coming, they're blaming the righteous for. They thought that he had brought the judgments of God upon them, and that if they could rid the earth of us, the plagues would then be stayed. So a decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. So this is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time where God's saints are, are praying and, and searching for, for God to come and save them. So and then the 144,000 triumphed. Their faces were lighted up with the glory of God. So we see that this, this group, the 144,000, are the ones who will be dealing with this time of trouble. And then in the great controversy, there's a beautiful picture of heaven and the sea of glass and the, um, <clears throat> uh, with a lamb on Mount Zion having harps of God and the 144,000 are there. And they heard the sounds of harps of many waters and the sounds of thunder and the voice of harpers harping with harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, a song which no man could learn, save the 144,000. It is the song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of deliverance. But the 144,000 can learn that song, for it is their experience an experience which has no other company have had. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes, these having been translated from earth, from having the living, are counted as the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are they who came out of great tribulation. The time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, they have endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgments. So we see that this is going to be a time where we won't have intercession, that, that we will not want to have at this point any sin in our lives, and that it will be a time of, of where um, people will want to, to slay this group of people because they blame them for their discomfort. So um, it's a time that we need to prepare for, like Jacob did, through prayer, through wrestling with God, and having our lives um, shed from sin, and, and continue to put Christ first every day. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this wonderful lesson of Jacob. Father, he gives us comfort because he struggled in so many ways. And Lord, yet you were able to change him. You were able to transform him 
So we ask, Lord, that you transform our lives to be more like you, to live a more Christ-like life. And Father, we pray when that time comes, that time of Jacob's trouble, we'll be victorious and be able to stand with this, you on the sea of glass and sing that beautiful song because we have, we have hung on, we have marched forward, we have persevered. So thank you, Lord, for being with us and hearing us our prayers, and may we have a blessed Sabbath. In your precious name, my man. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.